I want them to be themselves if they are whole. Yes, and with um, and respected that that I I'm a grown person, and these young kids are telling me what to do. What do you know about my life? What do you know about what I want? Yeah, it's, it's called I, care, not restriction. In, right. in mobility, I, love that. I mean, yeah. So you're remarkably young to have that level of insight. Um, I've got to say, I know you're not fresh, new, young, but I do know that you're relatively young for people who are in their 80s and 90s. Um, but evidently, you took in a lot of what works, whether it's for you or somebody you notice, and what makes a difference for people. And it's treat me like I am the boss of you rather than you are the boss of me. Treat uh, yeah. me like I'm a friend rather than I'm somebody that has this brain disease and you can't respect me anymore because I have a brain disease. It's like, well, you can still respect me. Um, and you can I know what's me. better for you. Listen to me because I know what's better for you. I, yeah. And I, when I put myself in their place, sometimes I do just want to I mean, go that would walk be around or go do this or go do that. And sometimes, I don't yeah, they, they need to be able to do that. I mean, why can't I go out a door? I mean, <laughs> who are you to tell me I can or can't? You know, the only reason we imprison people is when they've done something that causes harm to themselves and others. And even if I've fallen, even if I've eloped before, really and truly we're locking you up because you have brain failure? It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Give me freedom, but monitor my safety. Sure. But I'm not asking for this, like, I need you with me 24 seven. The guy wants to go out for brief windows of time and then come back in. Were you going to go there? Oh, you said you were going to get your lunch. Oh, you were going to go out the front anyway. You were going to go pick up the mail. It's like, if we were to think outside ourselves and create a community for those we're supporting, then hmm, maybe it wouldn't look so much like work as it would, I'm hanging out. Hey, would you like to come with me? I could use some company. Right. Yeah. So tell us one more story, because I know you have herds of stories and you have amazing ideas. But I want us to talk about at least one more thing that you've done. Yeah, I wanted your help picking what kind of story. Yeah. So that means you have so many stories. Tell me about some of the other stories, because those of you listening here, what I want to say to you is Katie has lots more stories, lots more ways in which she's modified things. So you can help us. Katie, tell me what some of the other stories are that you have. Okay. I have um, one that has kind of a few affects a, a few people. We, ha I have worked at a place that had a um, security alarm system mm -hmm. set up with a very thin hallways of um, of, um, of the memory care neighborhood. So when you entered the, from the elevators, uh, they both went straight out, as opposed to a giant circle or a square that kind of... So two legs off to right. the sides. And as you enter, you're entering sort of right. like into the crotch and now you got to pick a leg. and Right. And if you want to go back and forth, you're going to have to pass that station every single time. Elevator in that station. And there's a nurse's right. station or an observation station that is behind a wall-ish, half wall or a wall. Yes. And so there's, it's a very limited mobility area. Right. So the, or the um, what they wanted to do they had to keep the um elevators section or the open so people couldn't get on them right they didn't um, want people they, getting on those elevators that weren't they had, to get on the right elevator. exactly so that people mm -hmm. weren't just getting on the elevators they had this uh, uh very uh, loud uh, uh, that, that would set off every time uh, exactly and uh, 
constantly a problem because it didn't go off by itself. You had to go physically turn it off. So it was driving staff crazy. It was driving the residents crazy. It was driving the family members crazy because if you're in an activity and you're in it, like you said, or if you walk, you walked back this way and you want to walk back this way to the art room. And then if you want to walk back this way to the patio, you can't walk by there without, ah, it's, it gets very frustrating. And then if it's lunchtime or something, and, or if um, we're short staffed that day, then maybe that alarm goes off for an hour. You know, it's oh, not going to go off by itself. It became a real problem. So, um, and it's the kind of sound, just so we're really clear, that causes your amygdala to go, danger, danger, Will danger, Robinson, danger, something danger. often is happening, so you better go fix it. And after a while, after you hear it and hear it, hear it, guess what? Your brain goes, I don't care. Right. I, I can't because it's wearing me out. Exactly. To the staff, especially, like, there's, it's not a danger just because this happens. So we don't even hear it anymore. I heard it all the time. But so I have a couple of stories around that. Um, one of my residents that like to walk and rummage and yep. collect yep. wanted to go and look in the library and look in the art room and look in the patio and look in the people's rooms and her room and but constantly constantly um also she was she always wanted to clean she want, she wanted to collect and clean and and <clears throat> be busy um she wasn't necessarily as interested in things like you know, the trivia games and, so, and um, where you sit still for very long. She was a doer, not a talker. She exactly. She was a doer, not a talker. She didn't even want to supervise anybody. She just wanted to go right, run her own. Right, she wanted to do her own Under thing. Lunder. So I started putting in the in a room that was farther away from the, <clears throat> where she could collect supplies and put them, take them to the tables and set up for the dinner party, or she could, or she could set right. up for the kids coming or set up for, so we're going to have this activity after lunch. Would you mind helping me clean the tables? Would you mind helping me um, set or situate the chairs? Or So I kept her busy in, a, in an area that was far enough away mm -hmm. so that she felt like she was doing a service. She was needed to for that service, and she, um, and she was able to migrate without, <laughs> without going, eh. Yeah. So that was one where you took a human being and you engaged the human being in a space that did not require them going back and forth past this zone of noise. Right. I didn't so, block her off. She could yeah. stay right. She, she could have left find that to do down, down there. And so it limited her desire to go in that space because she had other things to go do. And they were all down at that one space where you put them in a room and you gave her things that had value for her. But there were other people as well. Yes, so. there was one that had a history in um, saving people, whether it was in the it was in the service and in the fire community. <laughs> like he, so if you hear if you're exactly if you're hearing all these alarms all the time and you are in the firehouse, Dalmatian right. dog in the firehouse. Exactly. Everybody. Ruff, ruff, ruff. I got to exactly. go check this out. Look, something's happening down there. I need to go save people. Even if he was comfortable in an activity, sit at the back with his cup of coffee, totally calm. Sometimes he'd like to walk around and check things out, check the perimeter and everything. But when he heard that alarm go off every time, he tried to save people. And nope. there are certain people, for example, if you're in a wheelchair and it's parked and brakes are on and you're engaged in the activity. And this guy keeps going, come on, come with me. Get up. It's We got to go. We got to go. It's Then it's causing them distress it's causing him distress because they don't want to be saved and this noise is going on that's not only interrupting the activity and and it's interrupting causing, people's lives with a false message right. because the, it doesn't really have anything to do with an emergency but it sounds like an emergency signal so and it should well <laughs> an alarm yeah. should be yes an alarm should signal but the alarm should not be what we should have something on the door inside the elevator that signals someone has entered the elevator that maybe shouldn't be in the elevator. And so down at the reception desk or down a floor, how many floors did the place have, Katie? I'm curious. Uh, in all 12. 
12 floors. Or, so this or, person, if they got on the elevator, there were lots of places they could get off. Right. Um, you know, and how many people actually who were on the unit actually tried to get on the elevator that versus were just walking up and down the hallway? I don't think I ever saw one person <laughs> get on the elevator, actually. Oh, my heavens. So we had already... <laughs> Because it was a doorbell that you had to push to get in. So if the person has to come let you in, then you watch as it, as people are I'm coming sorry, and going. My brain just went, excuse me, did I just hear you say that you can't really get on the elevator unless you push a doorbell? Thank you. Yes. Um, my, brain, my brain did that every day. So why in the world did you need an alarm to go off when nobody was getting on the elevator with the doorbell? Well, exactly. And there's a there's a fire exit door close to there. But even with that, it can nobody push that, that to try to nobody, get out. They yeah, nobody march, walking by. Oh, and, if, and the only reason they did push it to get out is because if there's a fire alarm you're going off, you leave. You're <laughs> supposed to go through the fire exit. Yeah. So well, the fire alarm would already be on by the time they would push it. So it was a reaction, not a let me get out of here and set the alarm off. They were just walking up and down the hallway that was designed for people to walk up and down the hallway. Right. And it, and with all the technology today, uh, with keypads and with um, dif different ways that, oh, and um, when they um, have a an alarm that can go off just in the nurse's station that doesn't doesn't have everybody. the sound all over the place. It could be hooked up There's, with an individual, and it's your turn. You get you keep it for two hours, then I'll wear it for two hours, then you wear it for two hours, and I'll wear it for two hours, so that we share the responsibility of monitoring the area. But one of us is responsible at a time, so I'm not counting on somebody else to go deal with it. I know I'm the person who's supposed to respond. I'll do one better. It was also, it would also be set off if you used the restroom that was next to the dining room. So if they went from the dining room to the restroom, it would set, it off. Would set off this front exit alarm. Mm. It sounds to me like somebody needed to go, hey, I have a question for you. Help me understand this because this is a really distressing system and I don't understand why we're doing this. Did it ever stop or did you switch jobs? I switched jobs, but it still hasn't stopped. Wow. Because I'm going to pause there because this speaks to Katie got to a place where if that kind of illogic is the logic we're using in a special care unit, you got to wonder, time out, I'm going to do myself in if I stay here and work with this illogical logic because I can't afford to lose me because there's, I'm there's got to be another way. There is there's, another way. And, you know, it's really apparent that people had systems in place and they weren't looking at the systems to see, did they make sense? Were they effective? Did they help people live well? They were simply systems in place because there were systems in place and you, that's what you did. And it's like, you can kill brains that way, you can distress brains that way, and you can destroy relationships that way for no good reason other than we're limiting mobility because we're worried. It's like, well, my questions and your thoughts are like, well, did anybody try to get on the elevator? Nope. Did anybody try? Ride to go out the exit only when the alarm was going off and they'd say, well, we're supposed to leave, aren't we? I mean, that's what they taught me when the fire alarm goes off, you're supposed to leave the building because it could be on fire. If I'm a rescue person, I should go and help people get rescued if that's the case. So we're precipitating a whole lot of distress for, and what people were simply doing, we we're being made mobile. I mean, they weren't even really doing anything. I love that you did more with the lady who needed things to fill her time in a way that you limited her mobility, quote unquote, but actually you just changed her mobility pattern. When she was in the room setting things up, breaking things down, helping you out, moving chairs, she was doing a lot of mobility activities. 
but it wasn't aimless and it wasn't frustrating for other people because she wasn't entering other people's spaces and taking people's things and then roaming around with them and causing the alarm to go off. But I'm guaranteeing, I will bet you, and this is just a curiosity, that no matter how hard you worked, you never got that alarm not to go off. Exactly, because then someone would go to the restroom or if someone would go um, want to go see a friend that lived too close to the yeah. alarm. And families would come up to visit and they would walk with their family member and the alarm would go off and somebody would have to go reset it or it got to be so annoying that people just quit bothering to go reset it for a while. Because I have my hands full. I'm trying to help somebody go to the bathroom. I'm trying to take someone down the hall. You know what? I'll get it when I come back because it's just going off again. And I know doggone well, nobody's getting on an elevator. Yeah. yeah. When, we, when I first spoke to you, you said technology should promote wellness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it shouldn't be irrational. <laughs> and I yeah. think that this this kind of system this is an example of the old thinking of just like when we used to put people in wheelchairs and strap them in there thinking that was helpful. When we used to put people in beds and we would restrain them in the bed with devices to keep them from getting out, to put them up the side rails and then realizing, gosh, we caused a lot of harm that way. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're talking about is just as harmful in many ways as those old restraints, because when we limit people's sense of self, when we limit their efficacy, when they we limit their role in living and we don't respect it, he's a rescuer. So when we set him up to need to do that and then that causes backlash and he ends up getting distressed and now we're having to medicate because he's misbehaving or we're filling out incident reports or someone else gets harmed and he gets potentially blamed, Nobody looks in the mirror and goes, you know, it's actually our fault because we set this system up to be arbitrary rather than helpful. So let's relook at that. And let's see what else is out there. Let's we look and see what other technological advances have been made since we initially came up with this system. And let's see if we should invest in that rather than continuing to use an illogical system in an illogical way. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a pause here. I know that you have more stories to tell and more ways in which you were able to make shifts and changes, but I also want us all to think it took courage to leave that job, but sometimes you need to have the courage to say, I can't continue to work in an illogical and non-supportive environment and be able to do the work that I am meant to do in the world of dementia care. Oh, but I'm not going to be silent about it. I am going to be willing to have a courageous conversation that lifts this up so others can realize that doesn't need to be that way. And frankly, it shouldn't. But it will continue to happen until and unless enough of us say enough is enough. I don't understand why my mom has a system that sets off an alarm. I don't understand. My dad doesn't need that. What he needs is this. Tell me how you're going to meet his needs because I'm paying a significant chunk of change to be in this system. And this is not logical. So this was our start of this conversation. And the reason for this conversation is that Katie connected with us and said, this can't be right. And we agreed. And so she was willing to share her stories. And she's got many, many more because this is not her first rodeo. But she also had to do as I had to do is decide time out. I'm not going to beat my head against a wall. I'm going to go look for places and spaces where people are open to the possibility of what we're doing isn't a good idea. And let's look at what the possibilities are. And I'm willing to try them out and then see what works. And let's share that out instead. Thank you so much, Tipa. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so and much. Thank you for all for being willing to listen, because this is how we're going to change the culture of care. Not only doing it, but talking about our doing it. And that's not necessarily a comfortable thing to do all the time. 
it takes courage to say this out loud where people might see and know where you worked and know what you did. You know what, though? If we don't say, you know what, this doesn't make any sense. People who keep doing that thing that doesn't make any sense think they're fine. And we're here to tell you, yeah, no, it's not all right. And it's not all right to do the things people do just because they do them. There has to be reason, there has to be logic, and there has to be a sense of purpose. And that's what Katie's about. So let us know if you want to hear some more ideas, some more stories. We'd love to share some more with you. But most importantly, I wanted you to hear that we can't save the world right away, but we sure do make a difference for each starfish we run across. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you next time for another Courageous Conversation. Hi, I'm Tifa Snow, and you just found our YouTube channel and watched one of our videos. I'm the owner and founder of Positive Approach to Care. Thanks for watching. And if you liked, if you have a comment about, or you would, please share it with people you know. Oh, and if you haven't yet done it, consider subscribing. We'll let you know when the next new video comes out. And you might want to visit our website www.tipasnow.com where you'll find other resources as well. See you there.